so I'll tell you, so hi everyone. Um, uh, I'm happy to be here and tell you a little bit about our research on uh, the human microbiome and how the host, uh, specifically the human host might be control or change or affect the microbiome and then how the microbiome can change host uh, traits and phenotypes. Um, this is my first time here and my first time speaking here and I think probably no, no one here knows anything about me or my research. So I, my uh, talk is more kind of a general introduction to what we do with kind of just talking mostly about the several studies that we have and mostly on the biology of some of, the, some of our studies and the results and less, the less kind of focus on the computational, um, computational side. Uh, I do mention some of the computational approaches we're using, but I'm, I'm happy to talk more kind of about, about them afterwards if anyone is, is interested. Uh, so who here has heard about the human microbiome? Who knows what the human microbiome is? Everyone, okay, so no introduction needed. Uh, just kidding. So I'll give maybe a one minute introduction, it's fine. So the human microbiome, there are trillions of organisms found in and on uh, the human body. Uh, there are thousands of different bacterial species, millions of different uh, um, bacterial genes, which are a lot more than human genes. Uh, as you may know, their the microbes are found all over the body, any kind of epithelial surface that we have in our body. So on the skin, inside our mouth, uh, the vast majority of them are, are in the uh, GI tract. Uh, the, I think the, the tidbit that I like the most is that the weight of the microbiome, if you take it kind of collectively, all these microbes weigh about two and a half pounds, which is about the, the weight of the human brain, uh, which is something I like to keep in mind every time I step on a scale, to just <laughs> take off two and a half pounds. Um, by the way, why is the microbiome talk always after lunch? <laughs> um, <laughs> So why, why is the microbiome important? And that's kind of a main question I, I like to ask whenever I kind of start thinking about the microbiome. Um, and there, there are a lot of, like, if you kind of not work specifically on microbiome research, but you just follow the news, uh, you probably hear a lot of things about the human microbiome and how it's doing everything, basically. It's affecting all these diseases associated with all these phenotypes. So what I, what I did, just to kind of get this part of the introduction is, I through a span of like a week, I collected all the news stories about the microbiome in the kind of in the in the regular news, and I took a screenshot and I pasted them here so you can see kind of what what seems like seems like people think about the microbiome. This is just one of them. Uh, I think the the microbiome influences um, um, uh, uh, two critical body systems and affects immunotherapies. There's another study looking at the, the talking about kind of the microbiome and personalized medicine. Um, another study, the Mayo Clinic, uh, the link between the microbiome and, and, and uh, breast cancer. Another study, another news article about the microbiome and stress, and so now the microbiome affects irritable bowel syndrome. Um, this one, it's also in the same week, so this one here is about how the microbiome or how your soap and toothpaste can be messing with your microbiome. I don't know what that means. Um, another one, the baby's airway microbiome is changing. Um, this is the one that says that if you uh, kids that suck their thumb and bite their nails might develop fewer allergies because of the microbiome is kind of activating the immune response. I was happy about this one because my, I have a two-year-old son who sucks his thumb, so I was happy he might not develop allergies. But then I remember that I used to suck my thumb and I have tons of allergies. So maybe that's not, uh, not true. Um, so if you read all these stories, it seems like the, the microbiome can do everything and associated with every, you know, all kinds of any kind of disease you think about, that's probably the worst one I've seen. The uh, so microbiome basically controls who, who you interact with uh, romantically. I don't know. Um, this, I, I, it's not supported by evidence, I would say. So th the truth is, microbiome can't do anything. You have to be very critical when you read all these news stories because a lot of it just show a lot of them just show correlations between change in the microbiome and some sort of a disease or a phenotype and um, there's very little information, I would say, about how the microbiome is actually influencing and maybe ca causing disease phenotypes. Uh, but I'll try to get to that later, kind of the last, last part of my talk. Uh, but if you kind of scratch all these kind of hype, uh, there is actually, the microbiome does have some important functions. Like in a, it can, uh, um, uh, can metabolize the kind of foods uh, that we cannot, can provide us with all kinds of nutrients. It interacts with our immune system and it can train our immune system. And the microbes can also provide protection against against infection uh, and, and pathogens. And 
it's kind of to summarize some work done in the last few years, and this is from 2011, there were a lot more studies since then, the microbiome has been correlated, associated with a lot of different diseases, a lot of different uh, um, human uh, um, traits and phenotypes. And it's something very interesting for me as someone who's coming from a human genetic uh, background, that when you think about the diseases that have been linked to the microbiome, things like diabetes, um, all kinds of autoimmune disease, uh, metabolic diseases, and if you look at all these GWAS studies that have been done in the last you know, 10, 15 years, there's actually a lot of uh, uh, similarities between the same diseases that have a human genetic factor, human genetic background, and diseases that seem to be uh, affected or at least correlated with the microbiome, things like digestive system disorder, um, um, cardiovascular disorder, metabolic disorders, immune system disorders. They all have a human genetic background, but also seem to be at least correlated with the microbiome. So basically you have those diseases where there is a uh, microbial component. It's not clear if the microbiome is causing these diseases, the microbiome is just affected, it's kind of a side effect of the disease. I'll try to talk a little bit about kind of this direction and some of the research we're doing in the, kind of the end of my talk. And there's host genetics, the human genetics that we know has an important, is an important factor in disease. And what my lab is, is working on and trying to figure out is this link here between human genetics and the microbiome. How does our own genes, our own genetic variation affects the microbiome and how this interaction maybe affects susceptibility uh, to different diseases. And I'll tell you two uh, separate stories about this. One looking at common genetic variation, so just in healthy individuals, genetic variation segregates in the, basically in the population, how that seems to be affecting the microbiome, but also disease-causing genetic variation, specifically you're talking about mutations uh, that cause cancer and how these mutations affect the microbiome um, that are actually near uh, tumors in the colon. Okay, and in addition to genetic effects, kind of as someone's coming from human genetics, I like to look at the microbiome as kind of as a quantitative trait. There are environmental traits, so everything that's not genetic that affects the microbiome. There are a lot of studies that have been done on this showing all kinds of, of effects on the microbiome. Uh, and I'll just kind of mention today a couple of studies that we've done, not really get into it, but just kind of show you, uh, to give you a taste of some things, like how it affects, the diet affects the microbiome, how variation between populations affects the microbiome, how other flora, parasites in the gut also affect the microbiome. And then uh, one really cool study we've done, uh, published recently about transmission via social interaction of uh, uh, the microbiome. And then the last part of my talk, like I said, I'll try to talk about this direction and a new approach, a new experimental approach that we're developing to try to see how the microbiome affects disease, how the microbiome can affect the host, how this inter-individual variation that we see that's affected by human genetics and, micro and environment can change uh, host phenotype. Okay, so I'll start with the first kind of study, basically trying to figure out what are the host genetics effect, effects uh, on the microbiome. This is a study I actually started um, in, my, in my postdoc with Andy Clark at Cornell, uh, also a collaboration with Ruth Lay, who was at Cornell, um, and Dirk Kivas, who was at abroad, both of them moved recently. Uh, so when we started the study, which was like four or five years ago, there's really not a lot known about kind of the genetic component that, that can affect the microbiome. This is the first study, I think, that was done on this, uh, where they actually looked at ge genetic relatedness between individuals here on the x-axis, and the similarity um, in individuals' microbiome, and as you can see, there is a um, correlation, maybe? Um, <laughs> this is an, a, a more recent study comparing uh, dizygotic, monozygotic twins and also individuals from, uh, that are unrelated and show that dizygotic twins have slightly less similar microbiome compared to monozygotic twins, you would expect, although it's not significant. And then individuals who are unrelated have uh, significantly more different microbiome than individuals who are related. And there was actually some really nice work done in, in, in mouse using QTL mapping to try to find uh, variation in the mouse genome shown here in the circle that's correlated with the microbiome. And you can see all those uh, patches here, colored patches on the mouse genome are, are uh, low size they found to be associated with specific uh, bacteria. And you can see the, the microbiome kind of here showing which ones are correlated, which parts of the, of the mouse uh, genome. And this is a, uh, another recent paper that we were also uh, uh, kind of had a small part in. The work by uh, Julia Goodrich, who was, was, was back then a grad student with uh, Andy Clark and Ruth Lay at Cornell. And what Julia did here is use about 1,000 uh, twin pairs. So about half of them are monozygotic, about a half of them are dizygotic, to look at the heritability of the microbiome. So what part of the variation in the microbiome is actually affected 
likely affected by, by host genetics. And if you plot the heritability, basically on the phylogenetic tree of the microbiome, you can see that some uh, parts of some microbes are heritable, significantly heritable, while some other parts of the microbiome are actually not heritable, so not significantly different between monozygotic and dizygotic. So taking all these studies together, um, there is, there seems to be a host genetic effect on the microbiome, but we really don't know uh, a lot about what specific uh, uh, genes, what specific pathways are involved and kind of what their effect is on, 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 on host phenotype and host disease. So the question we wanted to ask with this study is, what is the effect of host genotype on the microbiome? Specifically, what genes and what pathways could be involved? What could be a mechanism of interaction? Uh, what could be a possible role in controlling disease? And we're also interested in the evolutionary history of the interaction, which I'm, I'm not going to talk about uh, today for lack of time. And the approach we're using is combining host genetic data and metagenomic data and, and try to use correlation association techniques. Um, trying to leverage data from the Human Microbiome Project. And the goal was to use only publicly available data and not do any new sequencing. So one, one word about the, a couple of words about the Human Microbiome Project. So the Human Microbiome Project was a big study, NIH-funded study, to characterize the microbial communities found in and on the human body site. They had uh, 15 different body sites that they looked at, at a, a few hundred individuals. So the airways are sampled from the nose. Uh, Nine different sites were looked at within the oral cavity, four sites on the skin, and the GI tract is represented by, by stool samples, as usual. And to look at the microbiome, there are two main approaches uh, people use. One is shotgun sequencing, and we heard uh, a talk, sorry. Oh, you can't hear me? A little louder, okay. Is that better? Is that better? Can you hear me? I'll try to shout. <laughs> okay, so shotgun metagenomic sequencing, which you heard about earlier today, about approaches and how to uh, um, reconstruct genomes. So shotgun metagenomic sequencing is basically sequencing all the DNA in your sample. So you take all the DNA, sequence all the DNA in that sample, and then you try to map the race of different microbial genomes to try to figure out what's the kind of functional composition, taxonomic composition of your, of your sample. But there's also 16S ribosomal RNA sequencing, which is sequencing one specific marker gene within the microbiome to get mostly taxonomic information. So this is a very rich data set, a really great data set to look at the microbiome, but we had one small problem before we started, and that was that human genetic data was actually not available. So it didn't do any human genetic uh, genomic sequencing. Uh, the focus was completely on the microbiome and not on the host. There was no genotyping, no, um, no whole genome sequencing, so nothing at all. So what did we do? Um, well, there's a known issue in metagenomic shotgun sequencing from uh, human and host-associated sample samples, which is the host contamination. So when you sequence all the DNA in your sample, you get a lot of reads that come from the DNA of the host and are not really microbial. Usually those reads are discarded as part of the analysis. But we wanted to do, what we wanted to do here in the study is to see if we could actually take this contamination information and try to map it back to the human genome to get information on genetic variation in the, in the host genome. And uh, we used kind of a standard pipeline, was standard at the time, like four or five years ago, uh, uh, for analysis of basically low coverage uh, data. We were, we were trying to do, try to be very uh, uh, um, restrictive in like what we accept, and we were, did a lot of QC, and actually ended up with getting relatively good information, about 10x coverage for each human individual, just from this contamination information um, from, from the Human Microbiome Project. So we had genetic variation information in about 100 individuals, and the first thing we did is just look for correlations between genetic variation and the microbiome in general. So what, we're, what I'm showing here on the x-axis is host genome identity by state. So each point is the basically the identity of two or the similarity kind of two uh, human genomes. And on the y-axis, we have the uh, similarity of two microbiomes. So again, it's one minus beta diversity, which is kind of how similar two microbiomes are. And we see there is a correlation uh, although it's, it's small, it's pretty significant uh, between host genome identity by state and the microbiome. And we find, this is just looking at the gut microbiome here on the y-axis, but we find a similar uh, significant correlation in 10 out of the 15 body sites that we looked at. We also looked for correlations between specific SNPs and the, and the uh, microbiome, and we did this on a genome-wide level. We actually identified a number of sites in the human genome, shown here, correlated with uh, specific taxa within the microbiome, shown here as kind of a phylogenetic tree. And I'm not going to go over, although I'll just mention kind of one interesting, I think the, one of the most interesting results that we found. And this is an association we found in the 
on chromosome two with the abundance of bifidobacterium in the gut. And uh, this is uh, um, pretty interesting because bifidobacterium is a genus of bacteria that metabolizes lactose and actually prefers lactose over glucose. And the hit on chromosome two is actually right over the LCT locus. And the LCT, I'm sure most of you know, the LCT is the, is the, um, uh, the gene that causes the lactase enzyme, which is the enzyme that facilitates the digestion, digestion of lactose in the gut. So what we see here is basically a genetic variation around this locus. The term is the abundance of bifidobacteria in the gut, which is a, the abundance of microbe that likes to, to uh, basically digest lactose. So this is a really interesting result. Has been since then. Uh, we published this about two years ago. And uh, it was validated in at least three other studies with, with different kind of different populations. And it's a really interesting um, um, kind of example because I'm not really sure what the mechanism is, but what I think is happening is that genetic variation around that locus basically determines whether someone is lactose, lactose persistent or not. So whether, that basically determines whether someone consumes um, um, products, so uh, milk products, products that have uh, lactate in them. So, uh, or have lactose in them. And so basically this is what determines whether someone has uh, um, the, basically the abundance of, of um, uh, bifidobacterium, whether bifidobacterium has something to metabolize and has the ability to grow. Okay, we, we also did a kind of an enrichment analysis to find specific pathways that are enriched and functions are enriched among the genes that are associated with the microbiome. And we find a relatively strong enrichment of um, diseases are related to cancer, specifically colon cancer, and I'll talk on the second part of my talk about uh, our study looking at colon cancer, the microbiome. And we also do, did a functional enrichment analysis, not specifically looking at disease, but just general uh, categories, functional categories, and we found that uh, this is enriched with immunity-related uh, pathways, so phagocyte-related functions, uh, other immune-related functions, which is probably not surprising. Uh, there are a lot of studies that have shown that immunity, host immunity, has an effect on the microbiome. Um, and kind of the last analysis we did with this data set is kind of an enrichment going back to the GWAS results that I talked about earlier, trying to see if the uh, genes that have been associated with, with uh, genome or found in genome association studies are also genes that are found in our study. So what you, you see here is an enrichment plot. So on the x-axis, you have the p-value for um, um, association studies Basically, for each line, each of these lines is a given association study, and this is the p-value for significance. So for each of these cutoffs, we take the genes that are significant at that cutoff in that study, and we see what is the enrichment compared to the genes in our study. So most, most GWAS studies are in this kind of gray line here, so there's nothing significant. But for some of them that are colored here, we actually see a significant enrichment of what we found in our study. And the, it's really interesting because a lot of these diseases, a lot of these kind of GWAS phenotypes are related to things that are related to the microbiome, things like obesity-related traits, uh, celiac disease, um, inflammatory bowel disease, colitis, and also some other kind of molecular phenotypes that are not necessarily diseases, but something that might be related to the microbiome, things like uh, metabolite levels, HDL cholesterol, and so on. Okay, just to conclude this kind of first part of my talk, uh, we uh, mined the Human Microbiome Project data for host contamination reads and identified genetic variation in the host. We found a correlation between genetic variation and the microbiome. We found an enrichment of genes that are related to immune response in GWAS heads. And uh, we also find a link between genetic variation in the human LCT locus and the abundance of bifidobacterium in the gut. Okay, so just a couple of words about kind of this uh, um, exercise about using the microbiome basically as a quantitative trait and trying to map uh, genetic variants that are, that are associated with it. Um, and, and there are several complications with this, kind of when you look at the microbiome compared to other phenotypes, complex phenotypes usually use. Uh, there are a lot of potential traits, first of all. So the microbiome is a very complex kind of data set. There are a lot of different microbiome, microbiome taxa. You can also look at microbiome genes, pathways. You can look at diversity measures. There are a lot of things you can look at with the microbiome. It's really hard to figure out which specific phenotype you want to use. So there, there are multiple tests of different issue. There are a lot of different body sites, obviously. Uh, the data set, the data, there are some specifics about the data set. Like there are a lot of intercorrelations between different microbes. It's very sparse, uh, they're zero inflated, uh, and it's also relative abundance. And the most important part when you think about this kind of correlation between the microbiome and host genetics is that for a lot of SNPs, what we found in our, in our experience, uh, 
most SNPs are actually correlated with changes in a small set of microbes. So usually you don't see big changes when you look at genetic variation in a single SNP in the microbiome, but you see a correlation with a small number, a handful of, of specific taxa. So it's something you wouldn't necessarily see if you look at the microbiome at kind of a, at the, at the larger scale. So to try to approach this, um, Josh Lynch, who was a former uh, grad student in my lab, um, developed a new approach. Uh, this approach actually uses lasso regression to analyze the microbiome as a whole, and then identify SNPs that are correlated with the microbiome, and then identify using stability selection, identify the taxa that are associated with, just, with each SNP. So the input to this program is host genetic variation, a VCF file, and then a microbiome composition, OTU table for now. We're thinking about expanding this to other uh, compositional data sets, not just an OTU table. And the output is basically for each human SNP, uh, or not for each human SNP, but just a, a set of human SNP that are correlated with the microbiome, uh, and which gene it, it's in, the, the level of correlation, a p-value actually changed that in the revised version to a q-value, and then uh, the microbiome taxa, which is the handful of microbiome taxa that are associated with each SNP. And then we also developed kind of a, a nice visualization uh, website to kind of show this association between human uh, genes in a microbiome. This is kind of what the output looks like. So you can see, for example, this is a SNP here where you have five taxa that are correlated with it. And you can see we identify those correlations here. And the nice thing is that some of these correlations are positive, like you see for this green uh, uh, bacillus here, the green one is a positive correlation, but the blue and the light green one have a, have a negative correlation. So we find all these correlations and get the kind of single, uh, single p-value for that, for that association. Um, this is more information about this we want to read. We have a preprint uh, that we submitted uh, last year. It's now very thoroughly revised. We're going to submit a revised version next week. And the software is all publicly available if you're interested in looking at it. And this is the visualization tool. OK, so common genetic variation associated with the microbiome. I'll, now, before I move to the second story, I'll tell you kind of a couple of kind of uh, very, very short stories about other environmental factors associated with the microbiome. Um, and this is a, a, there are actually a lot of studies that have shown that our environmental factors that affect the microbiome. Uh, things like diet, for example, is the main thing, specifically looking at the, uh, the gut microbiome. And we would look at this from kind of a more evolutionary perspective and see if you have dietary changes between human populations that might represent some changes that happen in human evolution if they're associated with differences in the microbiome. And this is a project really driven by Andres Gomez, who was a former postdoc uh, in my lab and now is starting his own lab at, actually in, in Minnesota. Um, so what Andres did here is basically compare the gut microbiome in African populations that are uh, traditional hunter-gatherers and compare them to African individuals who, who are uh, more kind of uh, live in a city there and try to compare their, their microbiomes and also compare them to uh, American individuals to see if there are differences that kind of um, um, <coughs> recapitulate those changes in diet. And this is just a, a quick figure what what the diet looks like. So hunter-gatherers, you can see, usually eat this uh, basically meat of, of different animals and a lot of, eat a lot of nuts. It's a very fat-rich diet. Uh, but we have a, a second population, the Bantu, which are agri agriculturalists who eat a lot more vegetables, so uh, especially tubers and have a, a, a very fiber-rich diet. And you can see the Bayaka, the hunter-gatherers, in comparison to the Bantu, you can see right away, you can see very big differences in the microbiome between the two populations. Um, and more interesting, when you add uh, individuals from the U.S., or individuals who eat a kind of a Western diet, uh, you find these populations are actually much more similar to each other compared to the um, U.S. individuals. And we also find patterns, when we look at specific microbial taxa, we find patterns of these kind of grady gradients in the microbiome where you have a high abundance in the, in the hunter-gatherers, lower abundance in the, in the banter, which are agriculturalists, and then a, a very low abundance in the U.S. For example, one of the best examples for this is the Prevotella, which has been, in other studies as well, associated with um, individuals with kind of a more um, um, hunter-gatherer type uh, diet, and you can see this kind of shift in the microbiome where hunter-gatherers have a very large abundance, so 40% even, of this, of this microbe, while uh, agriculturalists have much lower, and then in the U.S. is almost, almost absent uh, from, their, from their gut. Okay, this is another study, a different study. Um, so everybody knows that pathogens are transmitted, can be transmitted through uh, social interactions, and this is also might be true for microbiome, so commensal bacteria in the gut. 
So there are a few studies that have shown sharing of microbiome in people that live together, but it's actually always very difficult to uh, know whether those kind of correlations are because uh, these people also share their diet and also share their genetics. So this is a project in collaboration with Jenny Tang at Duke and, and uh, Beth Archie at Notre Dame. And what we did here is use a model of wild baboons where we can actually control for all these other effects because we know everything about these baboons. So we know everything they eat, we know who they interact with, we know everything about their genetics. Uh, we basically know everything we need to know to figure out what is the effect of social interactions between individuals. So we can uh, construct these kind of networks as you can see here, showing the interactions between different individuals and looking at two different social groups of baboons. And when we control for all those, all, all those other potential co confounders, so we, we control for their, uh, basically what they eat, their diet, we can control for their genetic background. Um, uh, we can actually measure the effect of specifically their interaction with each other. And what we find is the individuals who, who interact with each other have a significantly more similar microbiome compared to individuals that don't interact with each other. And there's another kind of very, very short story, and this is a work by uh, Elise Morton, who's a, a, a former postdoc in my lab with Laura uh, Segurel from the CNRS. And what we wanted to look at in this study is the effect of other um, uh, there's the other flora that are found in the gut. This is also going to African populations, and something you can, you can uh, look at that you don't have in Western individuals is parasites in the gut. So we quantified the am amount of parasites in these in populations we looked at, and you can see all of them have a certain, a certain amount of parasites in their gut. And the kind of the more, most interesting result from this study is that we found a single parasite, entamoeba, that has the strongest effect on the gut microbiome, more uh, stronger than even uh, diet, stronger than everything else we looked at. Uh, so this is something also to consider when you look at kind of thinking about microbiome studies. Okay, so just kind of a, a quick taste of some studies that we published recently looking at the environmental effects on the microbiome. And now I'll jump back to human genetics and the effect of disease-related genetic variants on the microbiome, specifically looking at cancer-related uh, mutations. And this is all uh, spearheaded by Michael Burns, who was a former postdoc in my lab and now has his own lab at uh, Loyola University in Chicago. So if you remember this slide from three minutes ago where he found some uh, changes uh, of genetic variants and genes that are related to cancer associated with the microbiome, we wanted to dig deeper and see if there are any specific changes that happen in cancer, uh, specifically in tumors that might affect the microbiome. So there, it's a, a really important, I think, to work on colon cancer and the gut microbiome. So cancer is obviously one of the more uh, most common, most deadly uh, cancer, so about 100,000 new cases a year, 50,000 death, deaths a year. Um, and there is kind of a link between uh, cancer and the microbiome, although we truly don't really know a lot if there's a causal role and what is the specific interaction. So we know, uh, for example, people with, who have colon cancer have a decreased diversity of their microbiome. Uh, there is a change in abundance of a number of species, like Fusobacteria is one of the best candidates that people have, uh, that so far has kind of come out of a lot of these studies. Might, might be a causal effect for Fusobacterium too. And some uh, cell-based studies show that Fusobacterium can change expression of some specific host genes that might be related to cancer. Um, there is an effect of the microbiome on chemotherapy and the, the efficacy of, of immunotherapy. The microbiome, some studies have shown that the microbiome can be used as a screening tool for colon cancer. And specifically, the microbiome is also linked to a number of risk factors for cancer, so diet and inflammation. And it's not really deconfounded that kind of the effect of the microbiome versus the effect of those kind of dietary life history effects on, on cancer. So we know a lot of these kind of correlations, but we really don't know about uh, what is kind of the cancer-related microbiome changes and what could be a possible mechanism that basically for this interaction uh, between the microbiome and, and colon cancer. From my perspective, it's really interesting because cancer is a genetic disease, a disease that's basically caused by mutations in human cells and host cells that makes them proliferate. And um, because of that, I think it's really interesting to study the interaction between a microbiome and the genetics of, of the tumor, so specific mutations, uh, specific pathways, specific genes are mutated in tumors, and how that affects the microbiome to really understand the mechanism of interaction and the role of the microbiome in, in this disease. So the challenge we look at the microbiome in, in colon cancer is that traditional studies looking at the microbiome in cancer basically use the case control design. So people with colon cancer and then people who are healthy. And what they use is look at them, basically their stool samples. 
and look at the microbiome in their, in their, uh, in their stool. And th there are a number of challenges with these kind of studies. First of all, there are environmental effects. So diet might affect the microbiome, uh, exposures, you know, life histories, all those things, like I said, affect the microbiome and affect cancer susceptibility. Um, stool samples is, might not be the best thing when you want to look at colon cancer. It's a localized disease. You might be interested in looking at specifically the microbes that are attached to the tumor. And uh, lastly, there are genetic factors. We know genetic variation affects the microbiome. There might also be specific genetic factors within the tumor that affect, uh, that could have an effect on the microbiome. So what we did here is use a different method where we specifically look at individuals with colon cancer. And uh, we take samples from their tumors but also from a healthy tissue nearby. And we take their microbiome, sample the microbiome of the tumor and the microbiome of the healthy tissue, normal tissue, near the tumor, and basically compare the two to see if there are any changes in the microbiome specific to the tumor within the same individual. So having that kind of design gives us basically kind of an internal control for a lot of these kind of confounders uh, that we talked about. And in addition to looking at the microbiome, I'm also looking at the tumor, and we're taking a biopsy from the tumor and a biopsy from the normal tissue next to it, and we're doing whole exome sequencing to look at the, uh, the, the mutations, and specifically try to find tumor-specific mutations, kind of normalized by that baseline of the normal tissue, and try to see if there are any effects of specific mutations on the, on the microbiome. And the questions we want to answer here, first of all, is the microbiome that's attached to the tumor, so the microbiome that's in the microenvironment of the tumor, different from that and uh, the colon, the same individual? Uh, specifically bacterial, you know, diversity changes, taxonomical changes, and can we use the microbiome to predict tumors? And when I say predict, I mean statistical prediction. Can we use the microbiome to tell us uh, basically what, where it's from, that microbiome, is it from the tumor or from the normal tissue? And what is the effect of the tumor genetic landscape on the microbiome, specific muta mutated genes and pathways? What could be a mechanism here again of this interaction? And again, can we use the microbiome to uh, build a predictor for the mutational status of the tumor? So just looking at the microbiome, the first thing you wanted to do is just look at the diversity, change in diversity between normal and tumor. And each of these lines basically connect uh, um, two samples from the same individual, so the normal sample and the tumor sample from the same individual. It's red if it's going up, so we see higher diversity, so more microbial taxa in the tumor compared to normal. Um, and if you, what you can see here is that we have a significant uh, increase in diversity in the tumor compared to normal. This is really interesting because most studies that looked at stool samples actually find a decrease in the diversity of the microbiome. This is just kind of highlight some of the advantages of looking specifically at the uh, microbiomes that's attached to the tumor. And just another kind of uh, visualization that we developed for this kind of data. Each of these lines here represents one individual. And you can see here, each of these colors is uh, one microbial taxon. And the things that are on the right are the microbes that change, that increased in the tumor, and just the amount that they change, versus the thing on the left are things that decrease in the tumor. So right away, you can see there are some pretty big patterns, like a decrease in the red and blue in the tumors, which are the firmicutes and, and bacteroidetes, and increase in a number of other, other taxa. Specifically, really, uh, uh, we're happy to see the yellow here, which is the fusobacterium, which is kind of the, the one, one uh, candidate that is well known. And uh, so we found this association with uh, fusobacterium, so an increase in fusobacterium levels in the tumor. But we also found another industry candidate, Providencia, that we're kind of looking into now. And Providencia is specifically interesting because it has some, some features, specifically a, um, an LPS that's very similar to fusobacterium and might have kind of a similar function. We can look at specific functions of the microbiome. Uh, this shows you the change uh, in the, the p-value and the fold enrichment of specific uh, predicted functional categories in the microbiome of the tumor. One of the most interesting ones is virulence uh, proteins. Um, it's an interesting result because uh, 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 the virulence genes in the microbes are the, the genes that control the pathogenicity of the microbes, or the ones that kill and invade host cells and tissues. And it's an interesting result because it might indicate a mechanism by which the microbes actually have some kind of effect on disease progression. Okay, next we wanted to look at the, uh, the relationship between microbial communities and, and tumor stage. So what we hypothesize here is that the composition of the microbiome is affected by different physiological uh, and anatomical changes that happen in the tumor uh, compared to normal tissue and specifically compared to different stages in the tumor. 
So we wanted to see if we can use the microbiome to get a prediction of the tumor stage. So uh, we first used uh, linear discriminant analysis to identify specific taxa in the microbiome that are associated with stage. And we separated tumors into low stage and high stage, or stage one and two versus stage three and four, so we have enough numbers. Um, and basically combined all these uh, taxa in the single value that you see here, which we call a risk index. And then we use this risk index for the classification, and we use leave one out cross-validation to estimate the accuracy. And uh, we finally can actually use the microbiome with the 78% accuracy, 80% specificity, to say what is the stage of the tumor this microbiome came from. We can also look at the uh, microbes that are specifically associated and kind of drive uh, this change. It's the ones that are increased in high stage, it's the ones that are increased in low stage and identify a number of microbes that are, are, have been linked to colon cancer. Uh, now, going to the other data set we have, which is whole exome sequencing with the same population. So we identify specific mutations that are found in tumors compared to the normal. So tumor-specific mutations, hopefully maybe some of them cancer-driving uh, mutations. Um, and the genes that we, where we find the largest number of individuals that have a loss of function mutation, we focus here on loss of function mutations to try to identify more kind of maybe cancer driving mutations or mutations that are likely to change the, um, something in the interaction between the tumor and the microbiome. And the gene uh, APC is a gene where we found the largest number of individuals that have loss of function mutations. It's not surprising because APC is a well known uh, cancer, colon cancer uh, driver gene. Um, and uh, what we want to see is we actually use the same prediction approach that I just described to predict whether a tumor has or doesn't have a loss of function mutation in APC just based on the microbiome. And we find that it actually works. So uh, uh, we can predict loss of function mutations with 80% specificity, 73% accuracy just based on the microbiome. So just based on the microbiome, I can say whether a tumor has or doesn't have a loss of function mutation in APC. And these are microbes that are associated with it. Uh, one of the most interesting ones here is Christensen, Christensen Elaiche. It's interesting because this is the one using the twin studies that I mentioned before, the microbe that's found to have the, the largest host genetic effect. So the ones that's most driven by host genetics. I'm not sure what's the interaction with tumor here uh, and cancer, but it's something we're looking into right now. And we use the same approach for the 10 uh, most mutated genes in our cohort. And we find we can use the same prediction approach to accurately predict uh, the uh, loss of function mutations in five out of these 10 genes based on the microbiome. And this is the way some of these mutations affect the microbiome. So what you have here is an interaction network. And by interaction, I mean statistical interaction between microbes. So when you have a line, it means you have a correlation between these specific microbes in, your, in the sample. And this is what it looks like when you have a, a, a tumor with no mutation in APC. And this is the tumors that do have a mutation in APC. And you can see the correlations change a lot between uh, these studies. Uh, again, Christian cell seems seem to be coming up here. And when you don't have an APC of mutation, you have a decrease when you have a mutation. We can also aggregate the mutational information into pathways and uh, basically do the same kind of analysis where you find or try to predict the existence of a loss of function mutation in a pathway based on the microbiome. Uh, and we find some uh, that we can actually do this for, for a large number of pathways. This is just some examples uh, of cancer, specifically cancer-related pathways where the microbiome can be used as a predictor uh, for whether there is a mutation in this pathway. Uh, definitely some very important cancer-related pathways here, like MAPK signaling, uh, wind signaling, P53 effectors. And this is just the list of the pathways where we uh, were able to uh, perform this prediction from the microbiome. This is another uh, just kind of last slide in this, on this uh, study showing that we can actually do this kind of identify these correlations. So if you take all this information of those correlations between the pathways and the microbes, you can put it all in this one uh, kind of network visualization. And, uh, and what you see here, there are some specific pathways that act as hubs, so they're correlated with a large number of different microbial taxa, while some other pathways don't really uh, interact with a lot of microbes, like wind signaling, for example, which is um, an important cancer uh, driving uh, pathway, is only associated with a couple of uh, microbes. One of them is crystal again. Okay, so just to conclude, uh, we found that uh, tumor microbiome is more diverse than normal tissue. Uh, we found an enrichment of bacterial virulence genes, uh, or predicted bacterial virulence genes, and we find the microbiome can be used as a predictor for tumor stage. Uh, 
Um, we also, when we com also combined uh, the genetic information of the tumor, we find the overall microbiome composition is correlated with the mutational landscape. Specific mutations uh, uh, alter the microbiome interaction network, and we can actually use the microbiome to predict tumor loss of function mutations in, uh, in specific pathways and specific genes. Okay, so uh, I don't know if I have enough time. I wanted to kind of mention another study we're doing, but is that supposed to be the five minutes? Okay, so I'll just mention another study we're doing. So basically what I told you until now is just how all these things affect the microbiome. So we know that host genetics affect the microbiome, uh, mutations in tumors, common genetic variation affect the microbiome, diets, all these other things also change the microbiome. So we have all this basically variation uh, in the microbiome, and we really wanted to see how this variation can affect host phenotype and host disease. This is uh, another study uh, in collaboration with Francesca Luca uh, at Wayne State University, and specifically this is driven by Elson Richards, who's a, a really talented postdoc uh, in Francesca's lab. So like I said, tons of variation between individuals in the microbiome. This is one example for this, uh, looking at data from the Human Microbiome Project, which I mentioned. Specifically, if you look at just the gut microbiome, the stool microbiome here, you can see huge variation. Look at this blue line here, uh, which is uh, bacteroidetes. Some individuals have 90% bacteroidetes. Some individuals have, I don't know, 10%, 20%. So huge variation in the microbiome between individuals. Uh, again, the study that I've mentioned before, large variation between populations as well. There's also large variation between uh, different uh, different species, and specifically looking at primates, something I'm interested in, so comparing humans, uh, chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans, huge variation between their microbiomes as well. Uh, so we wanted to see how this microbiome variation affects host disease um, and, and maybe host, host pathways. Uh, we really don't know a lot about this. There are some studies that look at specific cases where specific microbes might affect disease, but we really know very little. There are a lot of studies that find correlations. And we really know a lot by now about correlation between microbiome and, and different diseases, but it's really hard to know how, you know, what is the mechanism microbiome can affect disease and whether it actually affects uh, disease. Um, and there are a number of recent studies that have shown, specifically in mouse, that when you inoculate colonized mice with, with microbiomes, you see very big changes in gene expression in the gut. And there are a number of different studies that have, that, that have looked into this and, and identified specific genes that might be interacting with the microbiome. So likely this could be a very important mechanism by which a microbiome can affect disease. So you have a change in the microbiome, you have a change in gene expression in the epithelial cells in the colon that are interacting with the microbiome, and that change eventually might change somehow host traits and, and, and host uh, phenotypes. So this is the hypothesis here. So between individual variation, between species variation in the gut microbiome can uh, drive variation in gene expression in the colon, and that uh, variation might eventually affect host disease. We wanted to look into this in kind of a high throughput uh, manner. Uh, so to test this hypothesis, we developed this new uh, experimental system. Briefly, what we do here, the system is primary colonic epithelial cells, so human epithelial cells, the cells that kind of line the colon in humans and the cells that interact with microbes in, in human individuals, and we uh, basically treat them with microbiomes, so live microbiome communities that we extract from people, the large variation between individuals, so we extract microbiome communities in fecal samples, and we inoculate these cells, we keep them in an anaerobic condition, so kind of to mimic the conditions that are found in the gut, and then we uh, basically measure changes in gene expression in those cells. And the, the goal is to see how this variation in microbiomes can control variation in gene expression and response in gene expression in those cells. So if you think about a lot of kind of response EQTL studies that were done in humans where you have, uh, usually you have one inoculate like a virus and you look at genetic variation, you know, cells from different individuals, we basically flip this design and we look at the variation in the microbiome and control the cells, control the variation in the cells. Okay, so, and basically we look at RNA-seq to identify changes in the microbiome. Um, Again, I can skip this, so we can see right away we see changes in gene expression in host cells depending on the time point where we collect them. Um, we see specific genes that change their expression in a way that's kind of uh, uh, consistent across individuals. This is a very preliminary result that we have from five microbiomes. Each of these lines is a different microbiome, and you can see, for example, DSE goes up in all individuals. Using a microbiome from all individuals goes up. After, and after two hours, goes down. This gene goes down continuously. This one goes down and stays. Uh, 
uh, after four hours. So I have this kind of consistent changes. But on the other hand, for some genes, we see the response that's very dependent on the source microbiome. So for some genes, we see uh, a, a change that's not consistent across individuals, and we see a huge variation. We can also look at uh, track changes in the microbiome at the same time in culture, and we see some microbes are remain consistent, some microbes that change in different directions. Um, the interesting thing we can do is we actually track correlations between the abundance of specific taxa in the microbiome and specific, the expression of specific genes is one example. There's, this is a correlation between the abundance of uh, ruminococcus in the microbiome that's used to treat the cells and the expression of IL, uh, IL-7R. Um, this is interesting because IL-7R is involved in colitis uh, and cirrhosis, and ruminococcus has also been uh, linked to cirrhosis. And we have a couple of other uh, examples like this I'm not going to get into. And uh, we also try to do the same thing with variation across different primate species, and I really don't want to get into a lot of it, just mention one interesting result where we find some genes that uh, change their expression consistently, regardless of which primate species microbiome we inoculate them with, but for some cases we see a species-specific change where only the microbiome from one specific primate causes this change. Uh, interestingly, a lot of them are human-specific ones, and when we look at the human-specific responding genes, we find genes that are enriched with GWAS diseases, specifically with diseases that are somehow linked to the microbiome, like HDL cholesterol, obesity-related traits, and so on. Well, that's it. I'll skip the conclusion slide for this. And uh, that's it. I want to thank everybody involved in the studies that I talked about, specifically in my lab. Uh, Michael is working on the cancer-related uh, microbiome human genetics works, and he now has his own lab at Loyola. Andres they worked on kind of the human, uh, together with Elise, they worked on kind of the human uh, uh, African population microbiome studies. Um, Josh, who worked on, Josh and Karen, too, worked on kind of development of methods. And we, I have a lot of collaborators that I, I I'm very appreciate uh, working with, and they're really great. And that's it. Thank you very much. Happy to take questions.